Let's talk about the uh, Albahar Towers. Um, you're here for the uh, CTBUH Innovation Award. You're the winners of this award for the External Automated Shading System, which is uh, an intelligent shading system that kind of, uh, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you describe it. Okay, well, the, the towers um, basically uh, are provided with, as, you, as you've described, an intelligent skin, uh, comprising a series of umbrella-like components. Uh, there's about a thousand, in fact, on each tower and they operate uh, as a group um, in response to the movement of the sun. And as the sun moves around the building, so the, um, the umbrellas or the mashrabiyah uh, progressively opens and closes throughout the course of the day. And there are, there's so many benefits that uh, we achieve through that, uh, not least being, as I mentioned earlier, the reduction in solar gain, um, the ability, therefore, to use less heavily tinted glass, which gives us much more natural views from the building, better daylight in the building, less use of um, artificial light within the building, um, and all the energy savings that, that, that derive from that. I mean, yeah, I mean, you've said it all from, a, from an engineering point of view, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, balance, I mean, th these things don't insulate the building. Um, they, they keep the sun out. So what we're trying to do is, is create a balance between keeping the sun out, uh, keeping the bad sun out, so we don't have to d deal with glare or we don't have to cool the building more versus letting enough nice light in so that we don't have to switch the lights on. And that's really the whole key, isn't it, to the, to the Mashrabiya, you know, the, the structure of it, the fabric on it, the, the, um, the movement of it, the timing of it is all to, to achieve. And then the overlay on top of that is the fact that the actual design of the building has been designed using some Islamic principles of design. So there's a geometric um, pattern to the building which kind of uh, speaks about the <coughs> traditional Islamic architecture. So it, it has a certain cultural and environmental uh, relevance. Uh, is this an idea, a, a building, um, this is such a highly customized job, something that can necessarily be replicated uh, and, and rolled out to other buildings or, or how do you see it? I think this is a this is a this is a unique building. This is a product of a, of, of a specific brief. It 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 it's, it was designed at a particular moment in time. Um, there was a lot happening in Abu Dhabi at the time. We were commissioned for the building. The the Abu Dhabi 2030 plan had just been launched. Uh, the Mazdar initiative um, was underway, and in fact, the Emirate was just about to publish its own um, environmental standard called Estadama. So I think this is a very particular building for a very particular client a very particular place in a very particular time. However, I think there are lessons that can be learned from this because as, as CTBUH very generously themselves have recognized, it does challenge the typology of, of tall buildings, certainly in this part of the world. Yeah, I, mean, I think in answer to the question, can it be done, it, can it be used on other projects? The answer is yes, of course. But also there's lots and lots of other ways to do similar things. You know, this is one mechanism. It's one way of having something opening and closing. There's, there's lots of others. This is appropriate for this context, um, but you know, uh, you could certainly apply the principles elsewhere. Yeah. You know, there's there's so much uh, there's so much tinting of glass, and finding ways to to deal with light that way. That uh, am I right? That shading has just really kind of not come along very That's prominently, not, at least until this. Until yeah, until absolutely, this problem. and I think you know, in in all of these instances, not just in the Middle East, but throughout the world, you know. <clears throat> Uh, one needs to look at vernacular architecture because vernacular architecture holds the key to so many of these issues. Um, and, and, you know, the, the provision of, uh, of a shading device such as a mushroom beer upon which this concept is based, you know, has been around for generations. So I think, you know, what may be perceived by some to be complexity is in fact, on the other hand, simplicity. And, and, uh, and, and one needs to perhaps study these techniques in more detail to learn um, how to apply them in the future. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, um, I can't remember which presentation it was this morning, it was the tower in Q8 that was using a very solid facade. And I mean, I think, you know, your sort of start point normally is your facade will be glass. Yeah. I don't know why that necessarily has to be the case. I agree. Yeah. And um, uh, solid facades are fantastic. You know, they, they're structural, they're thermal, uh, you can treat them in the way that um, SOM were treating them. So you bring shards of light into the building. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. And it, uh, it's just value for money. You know, if it's treated in the right way, it's, it's real value for money. And I think what's happened, I mean, I've been involved in the Middle East for over 30 years. And I think what I've certainly seen is there's been very much a free for all over the last 30 years in terms of what's been happening in the Gulf in particular, largely because of the lack of legislation and, and a, kind of a, a slight lack of understanding <clears throat> of, the, of the context. But what we're seeing in the Gulf now in particular is, is the introduction of legislation such as the Estadama standard, which is going to force a change in the, in the typology of buildings in that environment. So 
I think, I think things are looking very interesting for buildings in that region in particular. What's the user experience like uh, with the shading on the inside of the building? How, how will a building occupant see this? Mm. It's an interesting question because actually the fabric from the outside looks quite opaque, whereas in fact it's 85%, and it, sorry, it is 85% light um, resistant. In other words, it's only 15% transparent. And yet when one's on the inside of the building, the one's experience of the exterior is perfectly natural because it appears like a, a lightly gauzed net, net curtain. Uh, which stands off two meters from the building. So I, I don't know what Peter, Peter's feeling about it is, but certainly it's like being in a cocoon. Uh, one feels protected, uh, sheltered, uh, and shielded from the, from the extreme heat of the sun. But it's, but it's changeable as well. So depending on wh where you are on the floor plate, um, at whatever time of day, you get a completely different view out. Does this system uh, eliminate the need altogether for tinting glass? For tinting glass, yeah. I mean, the, we well, we, we have... A very, the, the glass isn't absolutely clear, but it looks clear for all intents and purposes. What it doesn't do is eliminate the use of, of blinds. So you still have internal blinds, but I, I think as I mentioned earlier, because, because you're taking the, the direct sun off the, the face of the building, off the facade of the building, you're just dealing with background light. Now, as everybody knows, you know, Abu Dhabi in the, or all year, but particularly in the summer, lots of background light, which has to be dealt with. It's still too much for occupants. So you, you have to use l very light blinds uh, that still allow a lot of that through, which can which then give you useful daylight in your space and you don't need uh, lights. Uh, a system like this, obviously the heat is one thing that you have to deal with in the sunlight. Are there other factors too that uh, uh, in extreme environments that you have to accommodate in your designs? Uh, yes. Well, yeah, dust uh, and UV. So the, the, the UV in the sunlight will attack, it will fade your material. So your material needs to be robust enough to withstand that. You don't want to have to be replacing the, the materials. And material selection is key. It's very dusty uh, most of the time as well. You get very few clear days. So again, understanding how you uh, make your, fab or your material and your facades resistant to uh, to, to dust uh, was a, another key thing. And it, I mean, in fact, the, the masher, I mean, this is one of the questions that people always ask about the, the durability of the masher mechanisms. Um, how long are they going to last? Um, and the answer to that is, um, well, they're sort of designed in a way that they're self-cleaning anyway, but they have been tested to the equivalent of 150 years service uh, in a wind tunnel with dust collected from Abu Dhabi and salt water and wind and everything thrown at them as the thing opens and closes for the equivalent, I think it was 300,000 cycles or something like this. So it's the equivalent of being in service for 150 years. So on that basis, we're expecting it to perform well, but we are aware that it is, as you say, a very um, uh, aggressive climate. Does a system like this take the pressure off of you in some regards in designing for extreme environments where this allows you a little bit more leeway behind those shades than, than previously? You or mean, no? Uh, um, well, I think by having uh, a dynamic system as we have, you obviously therefore introduce a number of uh, additional variables, and as a consequence of which, you perhaps introduce a number of different risks. So for, so for example, what would happen if the mechanism for some reason failed? Would occupants of the building overheat? I think there are, there are new judgments to be made in, in this kind of context in terms of the level of redundancy or a safety factor that one needs to apply. I think we've been responsible in the context of the, the council. But you're right. I mean, it's all about context. Uh, there was obviously concern about what would happen if one of these things failed because they're new and they haven't been used before. The consequences actually are nothing. You know, the, the, um, that particular masher beer will not work until you fix it. What does that do to the building? Nothing. What happens if your lifts don't work? That's a different story. You know, you, you can't use your building. So we, we're, we've become quite comfortable with lifts um, because we've used them a lot. And we're, I think we sort of jump up and down and get a little bit um, excited about the masher beer, even though the consequences are. No, pretty much. If I could just quickly go back to the, the previous question about, um, about the environment again and, and just maybe mention one, one factor that we overlooked, in fact, and, uh, and didn't really come to appreciate until we, we came to commission the mash review, which we're doing now. And that was, in fact, the overshadowing effect of one tower upon the other. Uh, and, and perhaps in an urban environment, you know, the way in which buildings 
behave as a collective rather than simply as individual you know building building uh, units so we have a situation in Abu Dhabi where in fact um, the um, let me just think now the south the, the southern tower actually um, projects a shadow over the northern tower for much for much of the day and actually um, that's forced us to reevaluate the the programming of the mushrobia units because we can actually have more of them open than we had previously imagined so you know when one gets into this territory you know you you have to be alert at all stages of the project uh, to things that you hadn't perhaps uh, anticipated well gentlemen congratulations on your uh, 2012 innovation award peter oborn with uh, Adis Architects and Peter Chipchase uh, from Arab. Congratulations. Thank you.